One last thing that I want to do here before I have Fred come on up and, and welcome you is that I want to obviously thank uh, so Ben, Taylor, and Lauren uh, for helping put this event together and also point them out because if you have questions, they're the ones to go see or, or myself here. Uh, so thank you all again for coming on out here and uh, we'll have our Dean Anchik come on up here and uh, welcome us, Let's officially start us off. So you're welcome. Thanks. Good morning. It's great to have you. Um, wow, a full house. And to have a conference here at Grand Valley State University of graph theorists, some mighty ones and some mighty ones in training, um, that's a real gift to us. We thank you. We really do want to welcome you. Michael has been trying to tell me what exactly a graph theorist does. Because I'm not a mathematician. Um, you will no doubt figure that out as, as I speak. But I understand a few things about you. I understand that you're kind of a network of people who think deeply about networks. You come here at a time when our college has been paying special attention to how data and narrative support one another, and certainly visual representations of information and interrelationships is critical to understanding. Well, this coming week at Grand Valley is also, in, in, in the wake of having you, also um, a week of celebrating the classics. So I thought it would be appropriate as a way of describing how the world is in need of specifically you to share with you mathematicians the famous passage in book four of the Aeneid where Virgil describes the way rumor, when not pent by truth, moves in the world, a world desperate for ways to understand. He was writing about our need for you when he wrote, rumor, compared with whom no other is as swift. She flourishes by speed and gains strength as she goes. First limited by fear, rumor soon reaches into the sky, walks on the grounds, and hides her heads in the, uh, head in the clouds. Earth, inclined to anger against the gods, so they say, bore her last, rumor a monster, vast and terrible, fleet-winged and swift-footed, sister to Coeus and Enceladus, who for every feather on her body has as many watchful eyes below, as many tongues speaking, as many listening ears. She flies, screeching by night through the shadows between earth and sky, never closing her eyelids in the sweet sleep. By day, rumor sits on guard on tall rooftops or high towers and scares great cities, tenacious of lies and evil as she is a messenger of some part of truth. Well, whether you use the standard model of daily and candle or the Maki Thompson model or your own model, you too can tell us stories, but truer stories of the spread of information through social media of our time. My Virgilian example is meant to suggest that this has been 
a concern of incredibly enduring interest to human beings. And these days, uh, maybe it's not too bold to say it's crucial, your work is crucial to understanding our new civic reality. In short, your contributions to the understanding of complexity and in particular to ways we can get our head around it have for a long time been powerful but have never been more vital. So we got you here at a good time. On behalf of our college and the university, thank you for bringing your conversations here to us. And our students are really pumped up to hear you. Thank you so much. I wish you a continuingly productive meeting and ask you please disseminate your findings wide, widely to a world in need of specifically you and in desperate need, in wild search of ways to understand to which, about which, we look to you. Thank you for coming. It is great to have you. And now, the real meat of the matter. Yeah. Okay, so we are very happy to have here as our first plenary speaker, Doug West. Uh, probably most of you already know him, so I, most of what I'll say is not news. Uh, he has graduated 38 PhD students now, uh, has 59 academic descendants. His publication list is quickly reaching towards the 250 mark, and that's with over 200 co-authors already. Um, aside from the refereed articles, he's written some books. Depending on how you count them, they are between two and seven. <laughs> um, looking very much forward to it being seven someday. Uh, because I would like a bound version. Um, and the last thing I want to do is take away any of our time to hear Doug talk to us about reconstruction. So I'll just keep it there, and please help me join Doug to GVSU. Thank you, Ben. It's a nice introduction. Uh, OK, I hope you can all uh, see this big enough. Um, I'd like to, oh yeah, so, so I've been coming to MITEI meetings for a long time. I'm not sure when the first was, but it might have been 35 years ago. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy that MITEI is still here. It's been a wonderful um, series of meetings, I think, and it's uh, great for graduate students to come and be able to talk in a friendly environment. Uh, and get themselves started onto bigger and better things. So MITEI has, I think, really been a great thing for the uh, development of the subject. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about reconstruction. Um, uh, this is joint work with uh, the next to last student of mine, uh, Hannah Spinoza. Uh, and you can find these slides at the top of my preprint page, so you can review them later at your leisure, or follow along now if you like. Okay, so let's talk first about what the classical problem of reconstruction is. <coughs> when we have a graph G, we say that a card of G is an induced subgraph that we get by deleting one vertex. And so when you have cards, you have a deck of cards. The deck is the multiset of all the cards. So if you have n vertices, you will have n cards, and some of them may be repeated. So for example, here, uh, this graph has these four cards. And the famous reconstruction conjecture um, by, uh, published by Kelly and by Ulam is that any graph with three vertices is determined by its deck. So you see I've sent the arrow the other way also here now. Um, if we have 
these four cards, then we know we have a triangle in our graph, and the fourth vertex, there must be four vertices because there are four cards and the cards all have three vertices. The fourth vertex must be put back in adjacent to some number of the triangles, and so you have the cases 0, 1, 2, or 3, and the only one that will yield this deck is when you put the fourth vertex back in adjacent to two of the vertices. So the deck determines this graph. So actually, the reconstruction conjecture was mentioned earlier in Kelly's thesis, which was in 1942. So it's appropriate to talk about reconstruction now because this is the 75th anniversary of the reconstruction conjecture. And uh, so it's a hard problem. It's been around a long time. So what do we do when we have a hard problem? Uh, oh yeah, well, we write lots of surveys about it. Okay. <laughs> Okay, what else do we do? Let's see. Uh, we say, well, notice that actually this graph is determined by just three of its cards. Again, we have to have uh, a triangle, and um, if we put the fourth vertex back in adjacent to all three, we'd have many triangles, so that wouldn't be right. Uh, uh, if we made it adjacent to only one or two, we would only have one triangle. So because we have to, so we must, again, with just knowing these three cards, the only graph that has these three cards in its deck is uh, K4 minus. So uh, on the other hand, uh, which three cards? If we take these three cards, there's another graph that has these in their deck. Uh, namely, if we take uh, K13 and just add one edge, we have a triangle and we have these two uh, three vertex paths as induced subgraphs. So um, it's determined by three cards, three of its cards, but you have to be careful about which cards. So uh, as I said, what do we do when we have a very hard problem? We define a more general problem, right? That's harder in some sense, uh, but it's more detailed. So Harari and Plantholt define the reconstruction number of a graph to be the minimum number of its cards that do not appear in anybody else's deck. So they determine the graph. Okay? So uh, uh, in that, the reconstruction number of this graph, I think, is three. Uh, you have another concept that you can consider, which was introduced by Mirvold, which is the adversary reconstruction number, saying, okay, what's the minimum k such that no matter what k cards I give you, you would still uh, have this graph determined. So that's going to be greater than or equal to the reconstruction number. Okay, so you have those concepts. And so just as a little bit of background for the idea of making a more refined version of the reconstruction problem, let me tell you a little bit of the results about reconstruction numbers. So Mirvold <coughs> showed that the reconstruction of any disconnected graph with at least two non-isomorphic components is three, so that's quite small. Uh, and it's also three for all trees with at least five vertices. Uh, Bolabash and earlier Mueller had proved that for <coughs> the fraction of graphs as n tends to infinity, that have reconstruction number three tends to one. That's what we mean when we say this is true almost always. Uh, on the other hand, the reconstruction number can be large. If you take uh, a disjoint union of complete graphs with r vertices, then the reconstruction number will be r plus two. And the reconstruction number of any graph is equal to the reconstruction number of its complement, okay? Because the deck of the complement is uh, you get by taking the complements of everything in the deck, right? So, okay. Uh, so in particular, if you take the complete bipartite graph with n over two vertices in each part, it shares n over two plus one cards with the slightly unbalanced complete bipartite graph. 
So that shows you that you need at least n over 2 plus 2 to determine this complete bipartite graph. Uh, and Harari and Plantelt actually conjectured that this is the largest the reconstruction number can be for an n-vertex graph, and that equality would hold only for this graph, the complete bipartite graph, and uh, also for its complement. Okay. Trying to avoid a cold here. <laughs> okay. So now, in fact, um, later, not very long ago, uh, it was discovered that there are some other graphs that have reconstruction number this big, this n over 2 plus 2. Um, so this only um, disproves the uniqueness part of the conjecture. So they still did not have larger reconstruction number. Okay, so we're going to consider a different direction of making a more refined version of the reconstruction conjecture. So actually, Kelly, uh, 60 years ago, um, had the following notion. Reconstruction conjecture, we delete one vertex and we have the deck. What if we consider the deck of all the cards that we can get by deleting L vertices from our graph? Then he conjectured that uh, if you have enough vertices, if N is sufficiently large, then every N vertex graph would be determined by the deck of cards obtained by deleting L vertices. And the original uh, and, and so we'll have this notion, the graph would be L reconstructible. So uh, in a sense, the larger that L is, that you can make L, as I'll make precise in a moment, uh, the more easy the graph is for you, easy to reconstruct. So the original reconstruction is just that M sub 1 is 3. And if you have at least three vertices, you can reconstruct from the deck. Uh, so McMullen and Radzisowski actually asked whether M sub 2 is equal to 6. Uh, when I say they asked that, the computer search, they proved that um, every graph with between 6 and 9 vertices is reconstructable from the deck of two vertex deleted subgraphs. But, you know, that was the limit of their computers. Uh, and the, uh, what about on the other end? So if you take a four cycle plus one isolated vertex, that has the same uh, deck of three vertex subgraphs, deleting two, as the graph that you get by taking the claw and subdividing one edge. Okay, so you can check that out. So those graphs are not too reconstructable. They have the same deck of three vertex subgraphs. So I'll say that the K deck of a graph is this multiset of induced subgraphs having K vertices. Then the reason why this L notion of L reconstructability makes sense is that the K deck of a graph determines the K minus 1 deck. So it's a very uh, easy observation because each graph in the K minus 1 deck would occur N minus K plus 1 times by deleting one vertex from some graph in the K deck. So that just means you know, by counting the occurrences in your K deck of a particular K minus 1 vertex induced subgraph. Uh, you just divide by this amount and you, and you find out how many times it appears in the K minus 1 deck. Okay? So that means that the smaller you can make K and still be able to reconstruct the uh, graph, the better off you are. So we're interested in finding the least K so that the graph is reconstructable from the K deck. Okay? And this will be the 
have the same meaning as L reconstructable when K plus L is the number of vertices. So sometimes we're interested in talking about how many vertices do we need and other times how many vertices can we delete. So for example, among our results, uh, the least n such that even telling whether the graph is connected or not can always be uh, reconstructed from uh, the deck you get by deleting L vertices is going to be more than 2L. Okay? Maybe that's not so surprising, but uh, that's an example of what we can show. So uh, let me list for you some of the results that we have. And uh, so in particular, what I just said follows from this result, which says that if you, so for example, if you have a cycle with n vertices, and your other graph is two cycles with n over two vertices, you can't tell them apart by looking at the k deck if k has less than n over two vertices. Okay? That's maybe not too surprising, but uh, yes, if you break up the cycle into two pieces, well, you, you have the same number of each induced subgraph with k vertices if k is less than n over two. And similarly, if you have a path with n vertices, you can compare it with a cycle and a path that where each of those has about n over two vertices. Let me not be too precise about that. Um, this statement is also sharp, that if you have one more than that many vertices, you will be able to tell them apart. Okay? In fact, you'll be able to reconstruct the cycle or the path. Uh, so, more generally, for any graph with maximum degree 2, we can determine the least k, such that the graph is k deck reconstructable. Okay? Uh, and, well, a corollary of these results, as I mentioned, with the floor of n over 2 vertices, in the cards in your deck, you may not be able to tell whether the graph is connected. <clears throat> now, uh, Manvel showed that it's, it's quite easy to see that can, you can tell whether a graph is connected from the deck obtained by deleting one vertex. And he showed that you can tell whether a graph is connected from the deck obtained by deleting two vertices. So we strengthen this. Uh, yeah, so uh, he, he showed that that's true when n is at least 6. And again, the same example of the cycle with an isolated vertex or the claw with one edge subdivided shows that you need n at least 6 because one of these is connected and the other one is not. And they have the same n minus 2 deck. Okay. So what do we show? We show in particular that for 3 reconstructable, if you have at least 25 vertices, you will be able to tell whether the graph is connected or not from the deck obtained by deleting three vertices. And for L in general, for the deck obtained by deleting L vertices, if N is kind of big, bigger than something like L to the L plus 1 squared, then you can tell from the deck obtained by deleting L vertices whether the graph is connected or not. Uh, and now, and this one is kind of a generalization of that result of Bolabosch and Mueller, that again for a fixed L, well, a as long as uh, N is a a somewhat bigger than 2L, then there's a small set of subgraphs obtained by deleting L vertices that will determine whether the graph is connected or not. Okay. So uh, I, w I want to tell you some about all these results. Uh, we'll see how far we get. Uh, but before we go into them, let me do a couple of things that are easier, just to warm up. Let's think about k-deck reconstruction from the deck of k-vertex induced subgraphs when k is small. Well, if k is 2, 
then all you know about the graph is the number of vertices and the number of edges. So there aren't too many graphs that are determined by the number of vertices and the number of edges. Just a complete graph, delete one edge, that's okay, and the complements of those. And that's all that's determined by knowing the number of vertices and number of edges. So, um, <clears throat> so we want to use this result, which is also pretty easy. Manvel showed that if you have the deck of k vertex induced subgraphs where k is at least the maximum degree plus 2. Then you can determine the degree list of the graph. Okay? It's pretty easy. If you have subgraphs that are that big, then you're going to see any vertex with all of its neighbors. Right? And the fact that you don't see um, a uh, subgraph that has a spanning star tells you what the maximum degree is, and then you can continue on and, and find the whole degree list. It's not very hard. So what are we going to do with that? We're going to show that if you have a graph that is every component is complete, okay? then as long as the components all have at most m vertices, then you can uh, reconstruct from the deck of m plus 1 vertex subgraphs. So why is this? Well, uh, if m plus 1 is at least 3, this we, we're given the m plus 1 deck, so we know the 3 deck. So we know whether or not the 3 vertex path is an induced subgraph. Well, 3 vertex path is an induced subgraph if and only if you are not a disjoint union of complete graphs. Okay? So we find out that G has the form, is disjoint union of complete graphs. And all we care about now is the sizes of those complete graphs, and that's going to be determined by the degree list of the graph. Okay? So that's fairly easy, that we can reconstruct all of those. So we can also reconstruct their complements, which are complete m partite graphs with at most n m, sorry, we don't care how many parts there are. The complement just says it's a complete multipartite graph where all the parts have size at most m. So a little bit more interesting is to say, OK, let's allow large parts, but we have an R-partite complete graph. Okay? So that's what we can we, uh, show, that any complete R-partite graph will be reconstructable from its R plus 1 deck. So again, since we know the 3 deck, we know since, there's, uh, since we don't have the complement of P3 as a card, we know that we have a complete multipartite graph. And since we're given the R plus 1 deck, we know we do not have a complete graph with R plus 1 vertices. So we know it is a complete r partite graph. And now the question is just what the sizes of the parts are. So we do something a little more interesting to determine that. If the part sizes are q1 through qr, let's form this polynomial. The product of x minus qi, x minus the part sizes. Okay? Well, if you take this polynomial and multiply it out, then um, when you want the coefficient of x to the r minus i, you have the product of i of those terms that look like minus q sub i. I have too many i's there, but that's okay. Well, what is the product of i choices from q1 through qr? That's the number of i vertex complete subgraphs that you have. Okay. So since you know the r plus 1 deck, you know the decks for all these smaller things, the d sub i, with i vertex induced subgraphs. As I said, s sub i is the number of cards in d sub i that are complete. So we know that. So we know all the coefficients of this polynomial, so we can find the, these integer roots. And that tells us the sizes of the parts. Okay. 
So yeah, that's a little bit interesting, not too hard. Okay, so I'm going to go kind of in reverse order to the, of the results that I told you I would tell you about. So let's start by thinking about almost all graphs. And the, the key lemma here, as I said, uh, Mueller did this in 1976. Uh, Bolabash came along and did it again in 1990. If you have a bit more than half of the vertices of the graph, then those induced subgraphs almost always are pairwise isomorphic and have no non-trivial automorphisms. So uh, random graphs are really random. In other words, they have, there's no symmetry. Even when you look at these subgraphs with s slightly more than half of the vertices. So that's the, the key thing that we use. And the theorem that we prove, so I'll say that the subgraphs with a certain number of vertices are good if they are pairwise non-isomorphic and have no non-trivial automorphisms. So our theorem is that uh, if the subgraphs that we can get by deleting L plus 1 vertices are good, then we will be able to reconstruct the graph from some set of subgraphs obtained by deleting L vertices, and not very many of them. I mean, there are n choose L of these subgraphs. We only need L plus 2 choose 2 of them. Okay. Okay. So... Uh, and uh, as I said, the, what we will get as a corollary from this lemma about random subgraphs, uh, uh, random graphs, is that the fraction of graphs that are reconstructable from the subgraphs obtained by deleting slightly less than half of the vertices will tend to one, as n tends to infinity. Okay. Um, okay. So the first thing I need to tell you is which subgraphs I'm going to use, okay? So what we're going, uh, and, and this is a short version of, of what I just said the theorem is. So let n be the number of vertices in our graph, and let's fix L plus 1 vertices, okay? A particular set of L plus 1 vertices. Let h be the subgraph that we get by deleting those L plus 1. Uh, remember, we, we really want to reconstruct from the deck obtained by deleting L vertices, but I have this special graph where I deleted L plus 1 vertices. Um, and let H be the number of vertices in it. So what I'm going to do is give you some um, subgraphs with H plus 1 vertices. That's where I've deleted L. So if I have this x sub i in my special set, consider the subgraph induced by all the vertices down here plus x sub i. Okay? So when I do that for all i, then I will get L plus 1 subgraphs. I call that collection of subgraphs C. Okay? C sub i when I leave x sub i in. Now I need some more. Besides these, I need some subgraphs where I leave two of the special vertices in. Okay? And if I'm going to do that, then I need to leave one of the vertices down here out so that, again, I have the same number of vertices. Okay. So that's going to give me L plus 1 subgraphs like this and L plus 1 choose 2 subgraphs like that. And this is where I get my collection of L plus 2 choose 2 subgraphs. And the idea is because the H vertex subgraphs are good, that I'm going to be able to tell which are the special vertices. And so I'll be able to find from, uh, I'll be able to identify C. So I'll be able to find from C this subgraph and all the edges between S and here. And then I go and look at these and use them to determine for each pair of special vertices whether they're adjacent or not. That's the basic idea. Okay. 
So to make this, so this is my claim, right, that I'll be able to reconstruct the graph from these vertices, these uh, subgraphs that I've picked. Okay, uh, and let me point out that there are many such families, right, because I could have chosen my special set of vertices as any L plus one vertices out of the N, so that's N choose L plus one right there, and then for each pair here, when I make this subgraph, I could pick almost any, there's a little bit of constraint, we'll see, of these vertices down here to delete. So that uh, is an additional something like um, H to the L plus one. So many, many collections that will work. Okay, so now to do the reconstruction, uh, the cards have H plus one vertices, and the vertices with that many vertices are good, sorry, the subgraphs with that many vertices are good, meaning they're pairwise non-isomorphic. And so let's ask which H vertex subgraphs can show up in these cards by deleting one vertex. Well, if, you, if your H vertex subgraph has three of the special vertices, then it can never show up. Right? Because the cards we picked never used more than two of the special vertices, and the H vertex subgraphs are pairwise non isomorphic. So those subgraphs, H vertex subgraphs, can't show up at all as subgraphs of cards in the deck. If we have two of the special vertices, then it can show up only if. Uh, in, in the card D sub IJ that we had, okay? If we have one of the special vertices, well, that occurs as a, uh, one of the C's, right? One special vertex and all the others down in H. And it also can occur sometimes in the D I J, if you keep this one special vertex and you've thrown away the other guy it matches and you have just the right set down there, okay? Well, we want it to show up a total of it at most uh, L times, and we can ensure that by just making sure that when the, the cards that uh, Dij over all J, right, you, you're keeping Xi, then when you put in some Xj, the Wij that you chose to delete down here is not the same vertex all the time, okay? So that's all you need to make sure that one of these guys is going to show up in at most L cards. But the special vertex X, the special subgraph H, sorry, <laughs> is uh, one that doesn't share any of the special vertices. So he's specifically that graph H, he will show up in all of the L plus one cards that are in C. So he's the only graph with H vertices that can show up in the deck L plus one times. Aha, so we can tell who he is. Once we know who he is, we look at all the places where he occurs. That's C, so we know, and, you know, and we know which subgraph he is because, uh, again, he shows up the, because the guys are good. So we determine each of the special vertices from C. We have all those edges. And then, as I said, we can go back, now that we know who Xi and Xj are, we can go over to the Dij and find out whether Xi and Xj are adjacent. So this is the summary of those things I just said, okay? Okay, so we've proved that one. So now let's think about connectedness, okay? Uh, so we're going to fix L the number of vertices that we delete to make our deck, and n is going to be large. So let me let C of D, when I have some deck D, be the number of connected cards in the deck. Um, so here's the easy thing about deleting one vertex. When you, uh, a, a graph is connected, one of the first things we learn in graph theory if a graph is connected, it has at least two vertices that are not cut vertices, right? Leaves of a spanning tree. So 
that means a connected graph has at least two connected cards, <laughs> deleting one vertex, but a disconnected graph has at most one connected card. So from the deck deleting one vertex, you can easily determine whether a graph is connected or not. So Manvel, uh, as I said, did it f uh, with n minus two vertices, as long as you have it six vertices in the graph. So let's try to get a bound on how many vertices we can have if we have a connected graph and a disconnected graph that have the same n minus l deck. Okay? So let's suppose we have g and h. g is connected, h is disconnected, and they have the same n minus l deck. So uh, we must have at least one connected card in the deck, right? Because, uh, I mean, when you have a connected graph, you're looking at g, if you just peel away leaves from a spanning tree, you're always going to have a connected subgraph. Okay? So the, our disconnected graph must also have a card that's connected, right? Because they have the same deck. So that means it has to have a component with at least n minus l vertices. As long as l, as long as n is bigger than 2l, there's only going to be one such component. Okay? And let it actually have n minus p vertices. Okay? So p is less than or equal to l. So um, when we look at H, the number of connected cards, uh, again with n minus L vertices, we must throw away the vertices that are not in the big component and some more vertices, and L minus P of them, from the connected component. So to obtain connected cards in the deck that comes from H, the disconnected graph, there will be, uh, at most, n minus p, choose l minus p of those, right? We throw away the cards outside, the vertices outside the big component, and some more, some l minus p more. On the other hand, uh, an upper bound would be n minus 1, choose l minus 1 on the number of connected cards. Um, well, just because that's an upper bound on n minus p choose l minus p, okay? On the other hand, if we let, ah, here's the definition of c hat, the number of cards having a small component, a component with fewer than l vertices. Um, well, if you keep one of the vertices that's outside the big component, and then just delete some other L minus 1 vertices, then you're going to have a small component. So you get a lower bound on the number of cards of H that have a component that's small, a lower bound which is N choose N minus choose L. As I said, you pick L vertices to throw away besides the one that you've kept that's outside the big component. So the idea here is we have looked at H, and in looking at H, we obtained an upper bound on the number of connected cards in the deck, and a lower bound on the number of cards in the deck that have a small component. Okay? So, but G and H have the same deck. Uh, that was the argument I gave for this upper bound. As I said, these bounds come from H, and we, we look at G, we're going to get a lower bound on the number of connected cards and an upper bound on the number of cards with uh, a small component. And when we put all this together, we get a contradiction. So we cannot have a connected G and a disconnected H that have the same deck. Okay? <clears throat> okay. So the other key idea that makes this work fairly nicely is we look at a spanning tree of our connected graph. A spanning tree, and, and look at its deck where we throw away L vertices. Okay? Well, when you have this spanning tree, any connected card here 
the same vertices would give you a connected card in G, because G just adds more edges. So the number of connected cards in D prime will be a lower bound on the thing we were looking for. On the other hand, if you have something that, uh, uh, some card of G that has some small component, when you look at the spanning tree, the co same corresponding vertices will also give you a card with a small component. So uh, that means the number of cards with a small component from the tree is going to be at least as big as the number of cards with a small component from G. So we have these two inequalities, which means that to get our lower bound on C of D and our upper bound on C hat of D, we can bound these quantities coming from the spanning tree instead. Okay? And the spanning tree is better behaved as a connected graph. We can do some counting a little better. <clears throat> so, um, okay. So let's look at cards in this deck that comes from the spanning tree. Let T be the number of leaves. When you delete leaves, you don't disconnect the graph. So we're going to have at least T choose L connected cards when you throw away L vertices. Okay? And so uh, this gives us, on, on the other hand, remember our upper bound was L choose L minus 1 on the number of connected cards. So we get some sort of inequality here that says basically that T cannot be too big. The number of leaves in T cannot be so here's uh, an upper bound on the number of leaves in T. So now if we take a card of our spanning tree and it has a small component, okay? Well, that component is some subtree and it is cut off from the rest of the tree by deleting at most L vertices, okay? Because we threw away L vertices. So what we're going to want to do is get a bound on how many subtrees can be cut off by at most L vertices. Well, each particular subtree like this that's cut off by L J vertices, we can show is a component in fewer than this many cards, fewer than N choose L minus J cards. And so this is where our upper bound on the number of cards with a small component is going to come from. Uh, this n choose l minus j cards in which a particular small component can, particular subtree can show up as a small component, and an upper bound b sub j on the number of such subtrees. So, uh, and we will show an upper bound on that product. And so when we put it all together, um, this looks fairly horrible, but, but the point is, here is the lower bound that we had from H on the number of cards with a small component. And we compare that with the upper bound that comes here, and basically that gives you an inequality on N that says N has to be less than this something like L to the L plus 1 squared. So that's the idea of it. And uh, when am I supposed to stop? Uh, 10 of? Okay. So um, this part is, well, okay, I'll show you a little more of this. And, yeah. uh, okay, so here's a tree. At least I have some pictures here. So <laughs> here's a tree, and uh, it has eight leaves. And suppose L is 11, and we're looking for subtrees cut off by four vertices. Okay? So, why did that move? Hmm. Uh, anyway, oh, this is the statement of the theorem. <laughs> okay. Um, this is, this is uh, I mean, the, we were looking for this upper bound on a certain number of certain kind of subtrees, right? Okay, so 
Um, so let me, let me just talk about when J is at least three. So we're talking about subtrees with at most L vertices cut off by J vertices from the rest of the graph. Okay, so, um, so here I have some subtree, and these red things are the set of outside vertices that have neighbors in my subtree. Okay. Then uh, our subtree will be the component of take my spanning my tree T, throw away those vertices. It's going to be the component that has vertices that are on paths between vertices of S. All the rest of the stuff is outside S, right? Okay, so that's the component we're looking at. And when you look at a path from this subtree through a vertex of S, and you continue on out, you will eventually get to a leaf of T. Okay? So in that way, we can pick J vertices. Remember, J is the number of vertices cutting off the tree. We can pick J leaves of T. So for each such choice of J leaves of T, so there are T choose J of them, that's where this factor T choose day, J is coming from. We want to think about how many subtrees like this can give us that set of J leaves. Uh, okay, so we're going to get a bound on the number of subgraphs that can generate that set of J leaves. Well, if I'm given a particular blue set of leaves, which could be chosen in T choose J ways, Consider the tree, the smallest subtree containing those leaves. Okay, that's the tree generated by this. So that's this, this brown stuff plus the orange stuff, but not this or that. So the vertex U that's in S, it's on the path from the leaf to F. Uh, and the point is that because I want subtrees that have fewer than L vertices, I can't be uh, farther from this leaf than L. So uh, the number of ways to place these break vertices and define this subtree is at most the number of solutions to this elementary combinatorial problem when you're looking for non-negative integers that add up to something that's at most L. That, you know, because you have <coughs> at most L vertices in your tree. And the answer to that elementary combinatorial problem is, is just this binomial coefficient. So that's why we get the T choose J times this other binomial coefficient. Okay, so that's the idea in uh, and the case is j equal 2, j equal 1 are a little bit different. You do your computation. Yes, so when L is 3, if you follow these computations, that implies that connectedness is 3 reconstructible when n is least something like 59,000 or so. But for any L, any L equals 3, we looked in more detail and was able to show that when n is at least 25, uh, that you can win. Okay. Again, we think probably you win when n is bigger than 2L or so. Okay. But, so there's plenty of work left to do, but there's some interesting things so far. Okay. Oh, yes, yes. If you want to know how to do it when L is, L is 3, um, there's an appendix at the end of this file that I'm not going to show you. Okay? But you can find it on the web if you like. And you want to see how uh, you can prove this statement when L equals 3 that when n is at least 25, you can reconstruct connectedness. Okay, so let's talk a little bit in the few remaining minutes about uh, maximum degree 2, the graphs with maximum degree 2. So it turned out that the sort of thing that we needed, or at least was relevant to what we were doing, was proposed as a problem in the monthly by Richard Stanley around the time that we were thinking about this. And he said, Suppose you have an n-vertex graph whose components are all cycles of length bigger than k. 
then the number of independent sets of size k would depend only on k and the number of vertices, not how you arrange them into cycles of different lengths. Okay? Well, that's just a very small piece of saying that the deck k decks are the same. The k decks, the cards that are independent sets, there would be the same number of those, no matter how you arranged the lengths of the cycles. So we proved the more general theorem. We extended that and said if you have two n vertex graphs with maximum degree 2 and the same number of edges, the, only, the reason why we're saying that is because maybe you have some paths in there, which are number of edges is one less than the number of vertices. If every component in each of those graphs is either a cycle with more than k vertices or a path with at least k minus 1 vertices, then the two graphs have the same deck. Okay? So this is where all our lower bounds for uh, graphs with maximum degree 2 are coming from. The lower bounds on how many vertices we need in the deck to be reconstructable in, in the graphs in the deck. So in particular, a special case of this is if you have two cycles and each has at least k plus 1 vertices, they will have the same deck as the graph where you make one big cycle out of those vertices. Okay? And similarly, if you have a path and a cycle, you can combine them into a long path as long as they're each long enough. And uh, the important thing for proving this thing is that if you have two paths, <coughs> each um, at least k vertices, roughly, or each at least k minus 1 vertices, then you take the same number of vertices and it's not going to matter how you distribute them into the two paths. As long as both paths remain big enough, you'll have the same deck. So uh, a, a lemma that says that uh, you know, if you have two graphs and they have the same deck, that you can add any other component to them and again, the two graphs will still have the same deck. Okay? That actually enables you to reduce the theorem to just proving these th three statements. Okay? So, then, uh, so then 1, 2, and 3 suffice to prove the theorem. And okay, um, this is the statement of actually, it's almost the statement of actually what the reconstruction uh, the minimum k that you need to reconstruct a graph with maximum degree 2. It has a bunch of paths and cycles, and it, the answer just depends on the order of the biggest component and the order of the next biggest component. Okay? So that's enough said about that. Um, so here's this basic idea that <clears throat> when you have these two graphs like this, each consists of two paths, uh, g1 is those two, g2 is these two, um, we want to show that they're going to have the same deck, and the idea is going to be to do this by sticking in three vertices to join the two paths and talk about the number of induced copies of any particular subgraph that includes this vertex as an isolated vertex. Okay, so it just be, the induced subgraph is just add P1 as a component to the induced subgraph you were interested in over here. Okay. And then what we show inductively is that uh, the answer here is not going to depend on which guy you specify as the special guy as long as he's not too close to the ends. Okay? So that's the basic, basic idea. Uh, what I just said is there. Uh, okay. And so I'm basically out of time. So um, so what I just want to say is that that's what we do. <laughs> okay? We show that that's independent. Uh, so this is the inductive proof of that, that that's independent of where you place that special vertex. The idea is you, you, um, you do your counting based on counting in smaller graphs, and in the smaller graphs, you show you're still far enough away from the ends. Okay? And then 
Uh, so here you get that first statement, the third one, and then you use that to prove the second, and you use the second to prove the first about redistributing the, the, uh, into two cycles. Okay, again, the same thing. So uh, two reduces to statement three, and one reduces to statement two. Okay, so that's how you prove those things. And then, as I said, that gives you all your lower bounds for how big the cards in the deck need to be to reconstruct your graph with maximum degree two. And uh, the upper bounds are uh, involve this sort of stuff to show that you will be able to reconstruct when you have that many vertices in each card. Again, there are counting arguments there. Uh, okay, and I won't have time to tell you about that. But let me just mention some open questions to end up here. Um, so yes, really, this M sub L that Kelly mentioned, if you are deleting L vertices, how many vertices do you want to have in your graph to guarantee that you'll be able to reconstruct? Show that it exists. M maybe it's just linear in N. Maybe it's 2L plus 1. The, maybe these, these cycles and paths that we were talking about are the worst case. They, it, it, I think that's true. Um, other kinds of questions you might be interested in? Uh, if you can't do reconstructability the entire thing, just what's the minimum n you need so that when you delete L vertices, you're always going to be able to determine whether the graph is connected. Um, what other parameters can you determine from the deck of k-vertex subgraphs when n is large enough? You know, we, connectedness, what about connectivity, chromatic number, matching number, all kinds of things. Uh, uh, kind of interesting thing about bipartite graphs. For the, uh, I showed you that the complete bipartite graph is reconstructable from the deck of three vertex induced subgraphs, but for a cycle with length 2m, you need to go up to m vertex induced subgraphs. So is it true that as you add edges to a bipartite graph, that the size of the deck that you need actually goes down? Uh, that might be too much to hope for, but it's perhaps interesting to investigate. Uh, you know, other classes of graphs, like we did maximum degree two. Other classes of graphs, maybe you can figure out what the least k is so that the graph would be reconstructable. And finally, here's just a very small question. Um, a complete r partite graph we know is reconstructable from the deck of r plus one vertex induced subgraphs. Um, but is that sharp? Can you reconstruct it from the deck of R vertex induced subgraphs? And we just have this one little example here to say that, well, not always, because here is a complete tripartite graph, okay, and it has the same three deck as this complete fourpartite graph, okay? That's very easy to check and, and see that that's true. So, but we don't have constructions for a larger R of uh, complete R partite graph that has the same R deck as some complete R plus one partite graph. So there's a little question for you. Okay, yeah, and the next four slides are what I'm not going to show you about. <laughs> okay. Any questions for Doug? Ah, hello, interwebs. Um, so I was curious, is there a connection between the automorphism group of the graph and sort of the decks that show up of the graph, or sort of maybe like the multiplicities of graphs that show up <coughs> in the deck? Um, yeah, sure. So if you have a vertex transitive graph, then there is only one graph in its deck by deleting one vertex, right? And it's, it's just there with multiplicity n. Um, and you know, similarly, the um, uh, well, there, there <clears throat> uh, 
if all of the two vertex deleted subgraphs are pairwise isomorphic, then I think you have to be the complete graph or its complement because uh, you would change the number of edges depending on whether you delete two adjacent vertices or two non-adjacent vertices. So that was, that's fairly trivial. But nevertheless, if you have a graph with a lot of symmetries, the uh, number of distinct cards in the L vertex deleted subgraph will be substantially smaller. And okay, so uh, yeah, and maybe you can make use of that. Maybe you, maybe you can, right? I mean, when, when you have the one vertex deleted deck, and the graph is vertex transitive, you can see that you have only one subgraph. So you know the graph is vertex transitive, right? So you're, you know you're in that class. So, so yeah, so it can give you more information. Thank you. Yeah, strongly regular, maybe. Um, that's an interesting question. I don't know whether it has been shown that strongly regular graphs are reconstructable. Probably true. But. Lowell, do you know? <laughs> Did um, you and Hannah provide a short self-contained proof to Stanley's question? Or is your only answer through reconstruction? Oh, um, yeah, uh, yeah, so th that's an interesting question. Thank you. Um, Stanley's proof that he uh, provided with his uh, proposal of the problem was by generating functions. You know, he, of course, it's Stanley. <laughs> um, yeah, so he, he showed that um, made, I can, he made some generating function out of this number of independent sets and so forth and showed that for the two graphs it would have to be the same. Um, yes, so our inductive proof uh, I initially gave an inductive proof that just gave that thing about independent sets for, uh, for the, uh, the two regular graph. Um, so, but if you want to get the whole deck, then it turned out to be easiest to prove this more general result. Um, and it's, it's, well, yeah, it did look like it was several slides there, but, um, but it's not that hard. Maybe time for one more question. Okay, then let's thank Doug again.